Amen. All right, here in Proverbs chapter number 31, of course, we have the uh, passage, the famous passage of the virtuous woman. We are going to be coming back here uh, probably halfway through the sermon. The title this morning of the sermon is The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Of course, I'm preaching this in honor of Mother's Day. And uh, I'm going to be preaching on the significance of motherhood. The significance of motherhood. Moreover, it's going to be about really the preeminence of the office of motherhood. The preeminence of the office of motherhood. And I'll get to shortly what I mean by that statement, the preeminence of the office of motherhood. But the sermon this morning is not necessarily going to be to, uh, to, to, I'm sure this will happen, but to praise mothers. More so, the purpose of this morning's sermon is to explain from the Bible, to explain what is really the importance of the office of motherhood. Let's begin in Titus chapter number 2. So we'll come back, as I said, to Proverbs chapter number 31. But I want to begin in Titus chapter number 2. And I want to show you from the Bible how motherhood is a major identifier of a woman. It is a major identifier of a woman. We saw that there if you were paying attention just reading through in the book of Proverbs there, chapter number 31. A major aspect of a virtuous woman is a woman who is a good mother. Her children are brought up repeatedly. The work that she is doing as a mother is brought up repeatedly. Here in Titus chapter number 2, we see instructions given to women just in general. And of course, a major part of that is being a mother. Look here in Titus chapter number 2. We'll begin in verse number 1. It says this, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity, and patience. So that's what's spoken of about the men. Then it says this in verse 3. We get, it starts to speak of the women. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as, become, as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and then it says this, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So notice, of course, the husbands are mentioned, but one thing that we see being mentioned also is that they would love their children. So their children are brought up. This wasn't brought up about the men. Now, of course, there are other admonitions to the man to love your children. So all the fathers need to love their children as well, but there's a special emphasis on the relationship when it comes to a woman and her children, to a woman and her child. And the reason being is because the mother was ordained by God into an office where she takes the primary responsibility of how the children turn out. The, the, the fathers are given, or the, the men, let's say, are given the responsibility or the role, and this, this goes all the way back to Adam, to when the fall occurred, that they are to go forth out into the field and they are to work. They are to go out into uh, uh, the world and to provide for their family. While the mother is supposed to be a keeper at home is what the Bible says. Go to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. They're supposed to be a keeper at home. They're supposed to, as we're going to see here in 1 Timothy 5, guide the house. But something specific that's brought up oftentimes is that they are to love their children. Because while they're guiding their house, while they're keeping the house... The children are there. So one of their main jobs is to teach their children, to guide their children. The women are primary, they're, they are primarily responsible for how the children turn out. This is a major job that has been delegated to women. So here in 1 Timothy chapter number 5, we're just going to read verse number 14. It says this, I will therefore that the younger women marry. So this is the will for a, for a woman. It says, I will therefore that the younger women marry. <coughs> Bear children, guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So notice when it starts speaking about what a woman is supposed to do, they're supposed to marry, and then what's the result of that? Of course, bear children, and then guide the house. Where are the children located? In the house. They're supposed to be guiding the things that are happening in the home while the husband is gone, while the husband is working and provided for his family. We can see that there's a major responsibility each time we look at the roles and the key identifiers of what a, a, a woman is to do. It is to be a mother. I want you to turn also to Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 20. We'll see this even further. This is very profound. It can be looked over uh, easily. But... The word Adam 
is just another word for man. You know, in uh, like 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the first Adam and the last Adam. It's talking about the first man and the last man, right? The first Adam, of course, his name was Adam, which is referring to him being a man, right? He was the first man. Well, he fell. Okay? But we have the last Adam, that is the last man, the man that came to redeem us, which is referring to Jesus, right? And this, of course, can apply personally as well. My, the first Adam or the first man would be like my flesh. And then I have the new man, like the new Adam that's living inside of me, right? <clears throat> it's referring to Jesus. So the word Adam, the point that I'm making is the word Adam actually just means man. But, uh, you know, the first woman was given a name and her name was Eve. So Adam just means man, but I want you to look at what Eve actually means, the, the name that was given to the very first woman. Look at Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 20. The Bible says this, And Adam called his wife's name Eve. And then it tells you this, Because she was the mother of all living. So I want you to notice that the name that was given to the very first woman had to do with what? had to do with motherhood. So that tells you just how important the office of a mother is to a woman in general. I'm going to have you turn to one other passage as well uh, and you can wait for me there for just a few minutes and it's 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. So notice how the identifier of a woman or what, what, who a woman is. Let's say who a woman actually is. A major part of her character is being a mother or of motherhood. Now, so many women today actually neglect the office of motherhood, which is really who they are, who they were designed to be. They neglect the office of a motherhood and uh, really the, 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 you know, and of course this, this falls into the, the feminist movement. Uh, you know, the feminist movement is much of what has persuaded women to move away from being a mother. They've been manipulated and they've been, uh, you know, brainwashed into thinking that motherhood is not that important. And to prove that is the fact that what they have done is they've caused women today to envy the job of a man. They've caused women today to look at what a man does and to envy the life of a man that they may have a career. Because all the time when you bring up to a woman, you know, that, hey, you know, women should be, say, a woman maybe that's in the world that went to college. If you bring up, you know, the, the, uh, the, the teaching of the Bible that women are to, to marry, to bear children, and to guide the house, that their primary responsibility is to guide the house, to be there with the children, to raise the children, they oftentimes will bring up the fact that they want to have a career. They believe that that is superior to being a mother. They believe that that is a greater office or a greater you know, uh, job, a greater position that they could be in. In their minds, that's what they truly believe, that it is a greater job to be out in you know, the work. Now, here's the thing. Men and, men and women are very different. Right. We have different roles. We have different responsibilities. God foreordained men to, do, to live... <laughs> in a certain way and to do a certain you know, thing every day and he foreordained women to do something every day and to have a certain job or office that's totally different. We're not the same. We're not the same you know, uh, um, you know, as far as our anatomy. We're not, we're not the same in any way. The way our brains are wired, we're not designed, and the reason being is because we're not designed to do the same things. Now that doesn't mean that one is greater than the other. That doesn't mean that one job is more important than the other. Now, I don't want you to feel like this is a contradiction, but there is a preeminence when it comes to motherhood, though. There truly is. So all the men just need to face this. And it goes back to the title of the sermon, and that is, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Now, who's heard that before? Probably everyone, right? There's been, there's been movies that have, uh, that have taken that title. I wasn't aware of that until I actually looked this up to see where it came from. And I didn't know the, the, the details about where this actually came from until yesterday. Now, uh, is anyone here aware of where that actually comes from? The hand that rocks the cradle? So it was a poem that was written in 1865 by, the man, by a man named William Ross Wallace. And the full title of that particular uh, poem was <coughs> The Hand That Rocks the Cradle is the hand that rules the world. Now, I've heard that in, that in its entirety as well. I, I'm, I'm sure most people here is, have uh, also... The original title of that poem, that actual, the title of that poem was changed many years later. But the original title of that poem was, What Rules the World? 
It was like a question, what rules the world? Now the, the, point, of the, uh, the point of the poem was to prove the preeminence of, <coughs> excuse me, motherhood. Now I'm not saying this to just butter all the mothers up or just because it's Mother's Day because I feel like I have to say this, but it is, it is a fact and this is true and this is uh, uh, you know, uh, very much so real. The, the, the strongest force, if you will, the strongest power that as far as what lies in the position of a specific office lies in the position of motherhood. Above, and this is above all offices. And the reason why is because whatever office that someone receives later in life, that person was actually fashioned and formed earlier on to be able to do the things that they could do later on in their life. A mother is the one who decides who a person or who, who a human being is going to be later in life. Now I want you to really sit down, I want you to, to stop and think about this. There are many people today that don't take the job of motherhood very seriously. These may be even mothers that, <coughs> that stay at home and that even maybe even take pride in being a mother themselves. But if you really stop and you think about it, and you ha if you had a mother that was truly dedicated and she was implementing you know, uh, all the things that she needed to do. She was dedicated. She had a child and she had a goal and a vision of what she wanted that child to be. She worked hard and she was dedicated for that child to turn out that way. There is truly nothing that stands in the way of that child doing what she wanted that child to do. If a child had, if a, if a woman had a child and even beforehand she just had a vision or a goal, whatever it may be, worldly or not, she had a vision or a goal of this is what I want this child to do. If she put enough time into that, if she put enough teaching, enough instruction, enough you know, effort into that child being what she wanted that child to be, there really is nothing that could stop that. Now, whatever it may come down to, you know, maybe she wanted the child to be a scientist. That mother has all the power in her, in, in her hands. The mother that rocks the cradle. All of the power of what that child will be one day lies in the hands of that woman. All of the power. Now sometimes, you know, these offices, and because maybe they, you know, the office of a mother may have been, is, is being discouraged today, you know, people are being discouraged out of being a mother, the office of a mother is, is oftentimes looked down upon or demeaned. You may overlook this particular fact, but that is true. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Now, every uh, you know, uh, president, if you will, every, uh, you know, let's say, great engineer, anyone who has ever done anything great in their life virtually. Now, there are some rare exceptions. You've also heard the statement that behind every great man, you know, it'll refer, you know, sometimes they'll refer to the wife. I can't exactly remember how it goes, but there's also a sidestep uh, version of that where it refers to the mother. Because the mother is the one that formed and fashioned that child you know, when he was growing up. When the child was growing up. Whatever he was taught, whatever he learned, that came from the mother. Now let's look at, uh, I had you turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 14. I want you to look with me at 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 14. Of course, Timothy was a great man of God. He was the protege of Paul, and uh, he's brought up numerous times. He was basically, who was the greatest Christian, Paul that is, he was basically the, uh, the, the number, his right-hand man, if you will. Luke was there with him, but oftentimes, he, you know, who is he mentioning? Very, very often. He's mentioning Timothy. Hey, Paul and Timothy. Hey, Paul and this person. Hey, uh, you know, I'm sending Timothy to you, he says to the church at Corinth. So you, we see Timothy being oftentimes mentioned over and over and over again, who is there with Paul himself. Now I want you to look, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but look with me at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Verse number 14. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 14. It says this. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, we see there a couple of things that are mentioned. You know, it talks about the things that he's learned. And then number, in verse number 15 there, number 15 it says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures 
scriptures. And then it says, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So Timothy, while he was still yet just a child, knew the holy scriptures. Now the question pops up, you know, who taught him the scriptures? The, the, the you know, obvious answer that most people, obviously, context of the sermon and everything, would say, now of course, is his mother. Now, not to negate the responsibility of the father that teaches his children as well, but the, mother, the mother's primary responsibility throughout the day is to be raising her children, isn't it? It's to be raising her children and a major job of the, a Christian woman in raising her children is to be teaching their children the Holy Scriptures. Now I want you to turn over in 2 Timothy to chapter number 1. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I believe that this further proves that the, the reason why Timothy turned out the way that he was was in fact because of his mother and who it was that was actually teaching him the Holy Scriptures, which this, this is probably already understood, but it was in fact his mother. I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Just a couple of chapters back. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I turned to 1 Timothy. Sorry about that. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. It says this. If you look in verse number 5. <laughs> excuse me. It says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and then it says this, and thy mother Eunice. And then he says, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Now I want you to notice the chain of, of uh, generations there. Uh, specifically, who is pointed out is his grandmother, number one, which her name is Lois. It says, thy grandmother Lois. And then it says, and thy mother Eunice. Now it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who taught Lois, right? Or who taught, I'm sorry, Eunice, which is his mother. Who taught Eunice? It would be Lois. It would be the grandmother, right? And then who taught Timothy? It would be Eunice, which was his mother, right? So then we look here, if we look back at 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 15, it tells you, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. So if we look at this passage and we look at the life of Timothy, we look at a great Christian man in the Bible, and we try to determine the way in which he got to where he was, how was it? It was, of course, by his mother. Now, I, I, will, I will speak of you know, uh, this to my wife very often times. I'll bring this up at, at different times just as a reminder to her. Now, I care very much about how my children turn out. My children, as far as what they will be one day, means a lot to me. And what type of man my sons will be, but also what type of, of woman that my daughter will one be. And I'll, oftentimes I'll say, uh, uh, some, I can't remember exactly, I don't know if I word it the same way each time, but I'll say to her, you know, I want my children, you know, to turn out this way. Or we want our children even to turn out this way. But I can only do so much for them. And what I mean by that is this. The, the husbands or the, the, the fathers in here, you have a very limited influence on your children, to be, to be honest. You have influence on your, on your children. But the amount of time that you spend with your children in comparison to your wife is what? If you were to give me a percentage, just the men that work, what's the, what would be a rough percentage? 10%. That's drastic. Do you understand that? I think that's a pretty good estimate. I'd say that's pretty, I probably would have said 10 to 15%. That's, that's a pretty close estimate. So, do you know what that means? That means that your wife, if that was the exact number for each person sitting in here, has 90% stronger of an influence on your children than you do. 90% stronger of an influence than you do. Obviously, that depends upon, you know, uh, the amount of time that you particularly have with them, right? You know, this, is, this, this can, and can sway from person to person depending on your lifestyle. But the overall point is this, that the, the mother, motherhood was designed, motherhood is a position or an office where one of the primary jobs and how they are identified is, of course, by their children. And God put the mother into that role and she is the one by and large, who ends up deciding who that person is going to be. Now, Timothy did not have to turn out the way that he did. Timothy could have went numerous routes. Obviously, there's free will given to each person. 
But the mother is the one. I'll have you go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter number 31. The mother is the one who has the drastic influence upon her children. She, she's the one that has the substantial influence upon her children. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter number 31. Now this is a passage, of course, about the virtuous woman. And, and we're going to read here uh, down through the ideal woman of what... Of course, this is uh, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is how uh, God, the God would say that this is um, you know, the ideal woman. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through man. But there's something else I want to focus on in this passage that may, you may or may not have thought about before. First, we'll read down through the passage of the virtuous woman. Look there in, in Proverbs chapter number 31, verse number 10. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So there's obviously different areas where she's an example. Look at verse 21. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. And then it says this in verse 21, Her, ch her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Now, of course, we see here the ideal woman. You probably have read it many times. So there are so many different characters, uh, uh, different aspects of the character of the virtuous woman that a woman could learn from. One of the major things that's brought up repeatedly, of course, how it's in relation to motherhood. But one thing that's very interesting to me about this particular chapter is the fact of who is teaching this and who is actually uh, speaking these words. If you, if you go back to verse number one, it tells you this. Chapter number 31, verse number one, it says this. The words of King Lemuel, and then it says, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Now, who's actually talking right now? Who would be speaking? It would be King Lemuel, right? So, well, you could say that someone copied this later on is what it could be, or someone added to the book of Proverbs what many people believe happened later. Just like the book of Psalms, uh, you know, uh, the, in the book of Psalms, not all the Psalms are written by David. You know, David wrote Psalms, and then there were men that were inspired through the Holy Spirit to write additional Psalms that were added to the book of Psalms, right? So that's what I would say was that this was probably uh, you know uh, added later on possibly by King Lemuel and he he is the one that, that put this in the book of Proverbs just like Asaph added things just like other people added things to the book of Psalms they were inspired by scripture later to add a you know a, uh, uh, a psalm or a song in particular but this says the words of King Lemuel so who are, who is speaking these words Lemuel is speaking these words. Now, it tells you afterwards, the words of King Lemuel, it says this, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So where did this come from, though? It actually came from his mother. Now, that in and of itself is a very, very powerful concept. If you stop and, and, and think about this and see exactly what is, is taking place here, there was a woman who was a mother who was inspired by Scripture to do what? To teach her son 
this particular passage. This, this passage, chapter number 31 of the book of Proverbs, the purpose of the chapter was that a mother would teach this prophecy unto her son. That's the reason why the prophecy came unto her. It tells you the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So this was a prophecy that, was, that came through his mother, as far as we know, and that was taught to King Lemuel. We see the importance then coming from the Lord that a mother would be teaching her children. We see the significance that when a mother's job is brought up in the book of Timothy, what does it speak of? Uh, or just a woman's job, if you will. It speaks of her bearing children and guiding the house. We see that also being spoken of in the book of Titus. So you see a mother's identity wrapped very much so in being a mother and in motherhood. And even we have a passage where a, 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 a woman is inspired by Scripture to teach this particular, inspired by the Holy Spirit, if you will, to teach this particular Scripture unto her child. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 15. Chop, uh, Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 15. So just a couple of chapters back. All throughout the book of Proverbs, there are uh, admonitions to obey your father and also to obey your mother. Of course, we have in Exodus 20, one of the commandments, one of the Ten Commandments is to honor your father and to honor your mother. This, this morning's sermon, the purpose is to remind all of the women of the significance of motherhood. The significance of motherhood. You know, uh, the husbands, as I mentioned before, the fathers, they have a very limited potential in what they can do for their children. Now, what you, the time that you do spend with your children, fathers, obviously should be effective and you should be trying to teach them the Word of God and you should be trying to teach them you know, about you know, uh, Christian principles and that the, the Bible is our authority, the way in which a man should be, the way in which men should live their lives. We should use every, op every opportunity that we get. But the fact still remains that it is women who decide how children are going to turn out. All of these children that are listening, even let's say the power that lies in the office of a pastor, I have very limited time to influence your children. I don't have that, 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 that much of time where I can preach unto your children to where I could change the, the direction of their life. Yeah, there are testimonies of people that say, hey, that preacher changed my life. You know, they'll, that'll be in one moment. I'm talking about where the vast majority of potential lies. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you may have some exceptional situation where some guy is sitting in, you know, uh, in, in a pew somewhere and, and his pastor just changes his life. Yeah, that may happen. But the vast potential, the, 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 the majority of the power lies in the hands of the mother of where every single child that's in here is going to turn out. All the children that are in here, their future... It's an open future that ultimately lies in motherhood. It lies in how they will be guided, how they will be instructed, what they will be taught while they are children. That is ultimately how and where this comes from of what a child is going to be. If you look at yourself, whoever you are personally, whatever, you, you know, whatever area you are in life, whatever work that you do, whatever you believe, you can probably look at your life today and see, and there are of course exceptions to this depending on where you grew up and what parents you grew up with and all that, but you can probably see a lot of who you are today in a major way came from who your mom was, came from how your mother raised you, came from you know, what your mother taught you. If you, if women, if they refrain from teaching their children the Word of God, your child will grow up and will not know the Word of God. It, let's say that, 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 as I mentioned, let's say that the fathers, they, they try to spend as much time as they can teaching their children the Word of God. That's, that's possibly the 10% of the amount of time that, that, as we said, as a mother has. Imagine, imagine the power that lies in your hands of who your children really could be one day. If you, if you took that power, if you took that office seriously and the potential that's there, and you guided that towards them being great Christian men. 
There could be in your family the next Timothy. There could be in your family the next David. There could be, if you had a true ambition and a true dedica dedication along with hard work, you could turn your children into the greatest Christians that have ever lived on this earth. Amen. And this would, this would vastly lie in the hands of the mother. Now, I'm not negating what responsibility the father has. But what I do want the women to understand is the importance and the significance that actually does truly lie in the hands of a mother. Now, and, and uh, you know, when, when, uh, when we have days like motherhood, of course it's, 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 it's a time where mothers need to be appreciated for what they have done. Mothers need to be you know, uh, encouraged for what they are already doing. But also use it for yourself as an opportunity to, to really appreciate motherhood and in the sense of understanding really what has been given to you and the potential of what your children could one day be. Now I want to look here at Proverbs chapter number 29 verse number 15. What we see here is we see the cursings and we see the blessings of motherhood. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter number 29 verse number 15 with me. It says this, the rod and reproof give wisdom. So we see the instruction or the importance of discipline and specifically spanking also. Then it says this, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now why does it specifically mention the mother here? Because all throughout the book of Proverbs there are numerous times where the father and the mother is brought up together. But when the child goes bad, do you know what happens? The mother's mentioned. And do you know why? Because it's, it's primarily the mother's responsibility. Because it's, it's the, the influence upon her children. If a child does go wayward, if a child does... Now of course, don't imagine just the exception in your mind. I'm talking about the majority of situations. If a child ha you know, does end up turning out to be a bad child, oftentimes, do you know what it would be? Now in today's society, the majority of mothers neglect that office and they go to work and they don't have the potential. They're neglecting motherhood. So that power no longer lies in the hand of the mother today if they're, if, they're, if they're neglecting their children. It now, it would, now would lie in the hands of, and the government obviously understands this, the government school system. That's truly what's going on. When we talk about how the government took over the school system, they, what they wanted to do is they wanted to replace the mother. The next generation turned out so bad because it was no longer technically the mother that was rocking the cradle. It was no longer the mother that was instructing and teaching the children. It was the government. It was our today our federal government and the public school system. That's who they're spending the majority of the time with now. Right. So they're neglecting. Oftentimes women today have neglected the office of motherhood and you'll, and you'll see that the children, if that's the case, they don't turn out as much like their mother as they would have. They don't turn out as much with the qualities and with the teachings of their mother as they would have. Do you know what they, they turned out with? They turned out with basically how they were molded from and fashioned from the public school system. The people that they were around all day. But those mothers that actually do have the office of a, of a mother and they, and they do possess you know, uh, uh, the, the, the potential they need to understand the blessings and the cursings also of, of motherhood. And understand that with, you know, uh, with great power comes re great responsibility, right? That's a true statement. Whether you know, it's, it's from a worldly source or not, that's an extremely true statement. With great power comes great responsibility. And having the power of motherhood, there's great responsibility that lies there. And it could ultimately be, it could, it could be a great just fantastic blessing. You could, you could invest all of your time in your children's you know, education. You can invest all your time in their spirituality, teaching them the Word of God. You, mother, could, you could determine today that your child by the time, and this is possible, don't, you know, don't just overlook things like this when I say this, like that's ridiculous sounding. You could determine today that every one of your children by the time that they leave your home is going to have the entire New Testament memorized. That is a possibility. I mean, you understand the, the effects when you, when you word it that way? You can determine today that every one of your children, mothers, by the time that they leave your home, they can have the Bible literally read upwards of 50 to 60 times. 
A hundred times. It's, I mean, that's possible. Then when you read your Bible constantly, how much free time does your children have at home? Hours upon hours, if we were to be honest. Hours upon hours. If you were to invest that time and you were to instruct them as a mother and be diligent and make sure that you knew what they were doing, you could, you could be sending forth the next Timothy. You could be sending forth the next Paul the Apostle. You could be sending forth literally the next missionary or the next evangelist to another country that is literally the greatest evangelist or missionary that has ever been sent out. You could be sending forth one of the most powerful Christians that has ever walked this earth. And it really do, it doesn't lie in your hands, Dad, to be honest. It really doesn't because, you, I mean, you can do everything that you, obviously, you know, being the boss, you, you know, you need to structure the household in such a way that you know what's going on and what's, what's taking place. But ultimately, it falls into the hands of the one that's rocking the cradle, the one that's there all day, the one that has the access to the children all day. It's overlooked oftentimes, and it's, and it's, it's, it's because our world demeans motherhood. But really the power that lies in the hands of the mother. The mother decides who the children are going to be. The mother is the one who directs and guides the path and the direction that her children are going to go. So we need to, we need to number one, we'll finish on this note. Number one, everyone that's in here needs to... Uh, encourage the office of motherhood whether you're a, mo a mother or not you need to encourage the office of motherhood and you need to let people know the importance of motherhood and the power that lies in the hands of the mother we need and we need to not you know not like the world we need to not demean motherhood mock and make fun of motherhood because that's what the world does they 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 laugh at the idea of the soccer mom and the mom that stays home with her children <laughs> and what do you do with all your time and all of that we need to not demean motherhood and discourage motherhood we need to encourage motherhood and all of the children of course they need to honor their mothers. They need to be thankful. They need to, to, to come to the realization of what their mothers truly do for them and all the work that goes in to it. And you know what? The men also, like it says in Proverbs 31, they need to rise up and call her blessed. You need to be thankful for all that you're... You care about how your children turn out, I'm sure. I do very much so. I, I very much care about how my children turn out. So when your wives are doing a good job, you need to be thankful that the wife that you have is their mother. And you need to honor your, your wives and, and be thankful that she is in the office of motherhood and encourage her in the area of being a mother. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you.